to me Talk to me Talk to me, talk to me. Oh, in your own special way, welcome New Mexico around the country and around the world. If you're listening, welcome to Dialogue, KSFR's Friday evening talk show where the conversation starts with you. And I have got an absolutely extraordinary guest and very rare voice out there in the world joining me today. So I'm thrilled to have him as our guest and bring him to you listeners out there. And I want to thank listeners, all of you who are listening, for joining us today. Who I have on is David Cohen. He is a professor of social work and associate dean for research at the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. He is also an author and practicing clinical social worker for over 30 years. And he writes regularly about social and cultural constructions of reality. His book, uh, well known, is Mad Science, Colon, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs. And we are going to take on the very rarely talked about issue of psychiatric coercion. Uh, But really, I want to read a little bit more of his bio before I bring him in to the conversation, because what David does is challenge our notion of, quote unquote, mental health and or mental illness. Um, And I, as you all know, listeners out there, I talk about this often, and uh, and he brings a rare perspective that allows us to open our mind and, and perhaps think of things in a different way. I want to read a bit more about his, his bio. It says that in his research, he mainly investigates ways that we can free ourselves of ideas that reduce mental health practitioners simply to technicians mandated to manage risky people and reduce consumers to bundles of neurons that need lifelong tinkering with patented drugs. He believes these ideas create harm, which he explores and documents through surveys, systematic reviews of published and unpublished literature, analysis of Medicaid and other administrative databases, in-depth interviews with practitioners and consumers, and historical research. He's published more than 100 articles and book chapters and, of course, authors this book, and he's here to join us. He's taught all around the world, from Canada, France, and the United States. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to hear me described so uh, glowingly before I've said anything. Well, after I after I listened to you, I thought I want to do what he does. How did you get to do what you? I love what you know. You just have such a unique voice. So let's let's talk. Begin by talking about this notion that, and I'm going to say, quote unquote, mental illness is a construct. What do you mean by that? Because most everybody out there listening, the average doshmo, says mental illness is a fact. It's a scientific medical condition that we know about. What do you mean by construct? Um, I mean that first and foremost, it's a word. Um, It's a word, mental illness. It's a couple of words, actually. And before that, it was madness. And before that, it was uh, lunacy or insanity. And before that, it was feeble-mindedness or idiocy or whatever. So the first point I want to make is that it's a word. And the word itself uh, shapes what we understand it to be. And the first point I want to make also is that whereas everybody can tell, gee, I know mental illness when I see it, nobody can agree on the definition nobody. There's no really accepted definition of mental illness. Is it biological? Is it uh, social? Is it psychological? Is it all three? Or is it two or one and a half? No one can really agree. Genetic. So that's right there in the beginning is that when in a conversation you say mental illness, I bet you I and and many of your listeners are going to hear what they understand it to be. And I bet you also that if they do say, well, to me it means, you know, this and this and that, no one's going to challenge them because really everybody has their own kind of definition and no one ever challenges the definition of the other. And that also tells you that we're not dealing with science, but we're dealing mainly with belief and custom and custom 
and tradition and legal issues and ethical issues and moral issues and economic issues, not really some entity that is universal throughout time and space. Now, what do you say to all the scientists out there that would, would argue and say, no, 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 it's a fact, and uh, you know, we, we have lots of evidence that shows that this is a brain disease? And, and the other part of that question is, if it is a so-called brain disease, why don't we call it a brain disease? Okay, so, so I think your, your question, uh, the answer, or I'm sorry, the question you just raised at the end is an answer to the question you asked, which is why don't we call it a brain disease? Many people do call it a brain disease, but the only people who don't actually are the experts in brain disease, the neurologists. The neurologists are really, truly experts in the functioning of the brain and the nervous system. In most neurological textbooks, you find very little mention of what are the common psychiatric diseases, if you will, from schizophrenia to obsessive compulsive disorder to neurosis to major depression to ADHD. Only recently have these concepts begun to be discussed by neurologists, but as a rule, neurologists diagnose brain disease and treat brain disease and brain dysfunction. Why do we have a specialty called psychiatry that also claims to be doing the same thing, except it keeps calling its problems mental disorders and mental illness? So if they truly were brain diseases, number one, we would have a single discipline. But the neurologists do not want that. They're not interested because they know that the methods of diagnoses, the methods of investigation of the problems and everything is radically different in psychiatry than it is in neurology. And in what ways? Well, uh, psychiatry you diagnose mainly by eyeballing someone and pronouncing a statement. Now, of course, it may sound like an exaggeration, but in a few minutes, you can walk into a, almost any physician's office and come out diagnosed with a mental disorder after a simple conversation. Now, neurologists do use conversation and very in-depth conversation sometimes to really figure out what people are saying. But many of the diagnoses in, in neurology are objective. In other words, they're often based on some observable easily locatable problem in the body or the brain and the nervous system, not in psychiatry. What we do in psychiatry is we claim that it is a brain disease, that of course we have not yet discovered what kind of brain disease, where in the brain, how in the brain, and we keep claiming that it's just around the corner. But we've been doing that for a couple of hundred years and we just keep promising that we'll deliver, but we don't deliver. And I mean we, not that I'm a psychiatrist, but in the mental health professions, we get this idea that, of course, it's a brain disease. Everybody knows. Everybody knows it's a chemical imbalance. Okay, which one? Where? And why hasn't the discoverer of that gotten a Nobel Prize or five Nobel Prizes? What's going on? So we keep saying and claiming and promising, but but it's not delivered. And that's radically different from neurology. So then what purpose does psychiatry serve? Wow. Well, let me say now that when I say or when you say or psychiatry, I want to include a lot of the mental health profession. Uh, not that they're not different from psychiatry. And I mean here a number of other medical professions, both but including somewhat neurology also, but other medical professions from internal medicine to pediatrics to general practitioners. But I also want to include psychologists and social workers and nurses and the sort of large array of, of other more or less credentialed professionals. I want to put them all in the same bag because increasingly they talk the same language. They use the same, you know, DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. They increasingly sort of um, uh, pursue the same goals. They seem to say the same things as overall. And many exceptions exist, and I'll be happy to talk about them. But, um, and so you ask me, what is the function of psychiatry? What does psychiatry exist? Well, it has many, many, many functions. An obvious one is to discipline, if you will, the deviants. Deviants that deviate from norms special kinds of norms, norms of conduct, norms of behavior, uh, 
norms of deep values like should I stay alive? Uh, should I, you know, have any attachment to my family? Should I uh, pursue the uh, acquiring property and wealth? Uh, these are fundamental values that most people kind of agree to in society without having thought about them. We just are brought up in them. And sometimes some people just question these values profoundly, and they disturb us. They disturb our peace of mind. They disturb our, our, our stability. And sometimes they, of course, disturb us as persons. They disturb our, our, our safety, and they disturb our property. And so for those reasons, um, psychiatry comes in because it is specially mandated in a network of institutions that it runs itself to take care of these people on the grounds that they are ill. Now, why does it use that tactic, if you will, of saying they are ill. Why don't we just say, look, uh, you broke the law, or you didn't break the law. You're innocent, and so I'll leave you alone. Why do we in impinge on many people's lives? That's another sort of uh, question that we can talk about in a moment. But what else does psychiatry do? Um, psychiatry and the mental health professions also subtly, in other words, in subtle ways, not in overt ways, um, they have replaced, if you will, the, the pastors and the priests and the rabbis. They are a kind of secular priests. They're where a lot of people turn in moments of ultimate crisis, when, you know, everything is going wrong and you've got nowhere else to hang on to. Where do you go now today? A lot of people go to the mental health system. And that's their ultimate source of support and that says a lot about where we're at today that in many ways like i suggest they've and as other people have suggested notably um, people like thomas saws they uh we've moved from a sort of age of faith overall over the last few hundred years to an age of science and now we're of course moving beyond an age of science into some other unknown territory and i can't even begin to sketch it but in that uh, new age, the roles of psychiatrists and the mental health professions will also differ and change. We have new emerging ones. People are taking more charge of what they call their mental health. So we, we're in a big time of flux. Um, so my point generally here is that either through brute force or through indoctrination or through conversations and most of which are voluntary and sometimes very helpful psychiatrists keep us on the straight path if you will as defined by tradition and custom and 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 law and morality so there would you say they're sort of like psychological moral police almost yes yes psychological moral police and sometimes directly uh, police police mm -hmm. that is they are among the only professionals who are empowered to coerce you. And and Which, they and they really are selectively it, right? I mean, who they, else other than what Yes, they are other than a judge. Uh I do not and 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 in some way they might even carry more power than a judge because whereas a judge might not just compel you to be incarcerated just on a on on their opinion a a psychiatrist could compel a judge to incarcerate you on the psychiatrist's opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so there is, there is this power that no other physician has, except maybe in cases of extremely dangerous contagion. Maybe if there's a, a sort of an infection or a public health emergency that involves infection or so some people might be quarantined against their will that occasionally occurs and it's quite quite rare even around the world but on a daily basis in the united states and in most of the world people are quarantined against their will simply because in uh relatives opinions or a psychiatrist's opinions they may be dangerous to themselves or others because of mental illness, or what which, we, is, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, 
is a very vague construct. Right. We could, you know, we could get into. Many people have discussed the lack of validity, you know, the, the correspondence to the truth of psychiatric diagnoses, how they change from edition to edition, how people can't quite agree on exactly what they'll diagnose the same individual, and all these problems that plague what we call the validity and the reliability of diagnosis in psychiatry, problems that have been recognized by the highest authorities in that field for the last few years, especially since the arrival of DSM-5 in 2012, 2013, those problems came to the fore. There were, you know, newspaper stories on all the, the, pro the promises that had been made about the, the biomarkers that would be found to validate the diagnoses, and they were still not found, and it was still behavioral, you know, I'm eyeballing you and I recognize a pattern, so therefore you have that disease. And that was exposed, and now it's no longer a secret. And people have to realize that that's where the field is at. And uh, there's a lot of talk about genetics and uh, the genome and uh, polygenic conditions and stuff, but it's just still a lot of words. We still don't have the substance of what is exactly that problem that you call a mental illness, and how is it a, a manifestation of nature. How do we find that it's anchored in your body the way that psychiatry says it is? Well, we still haven't figured that out. And why are we so prone to being indoctrinated? I mean, what, you know, one of the questions I have is why, how can we, the, the main, there's just the mainstream people, lay people, why are we not getting the other side that maybe this, this DSM isn't so, I mean, why are we not hearing the real story that, the DSM is not really scientifically based, and there's a lot of questions about it within the field, within highest, our highest academic institutions. This is a debate that is taking place, but we don't hear it on our mainstream news. What we hear are that we've got chemical imbalances, and we need to take meds, and there's depression. You know, there, I mean, we have... It's conventional wisdom to the point where now we're, we describe each other this way. We describe ourselves using yeah. these diagnostic terms. How does that happen so easily? How are we so prone to being so-called indoctrinated? Or would that be the right word to use? Well, MK, I would think that your, your commentary of the last minute is, uh, is worth uh, you know, framing, if I may say so. It's simply that you're asking very, very, very fundamental, really deep questions for which there are no simple answers. But one, one part of the answer is a general answer about us as human beings. We do seek um, comfort, reassurance. We seek that. We always seek that from the moment we're, we're born. We, we, we depend on someone, uh, hopefully a competent carer, a mom, a dad, uh, a parent, someone to take care of us and reassure us and, and, and act in our interests and tell us. And that's how we learn. That's how we become socialized. And later on, we trust authorities, what they tell us. So there's something, you know, deeply human about wanting to believe and wanting to be reassured and trusting authorities. But on the other hand, there's also something very, you know, political about the information we hear. And I'm not saying anything uh, new here. I'm saying something very obvious. Whether you're talking about, I don't know, climate change or what's, what's the best mode of transportation or what's the best fuel to use, we know that that sort of information is very much um, engineered by a lot of very, very important large corporations that make a lot of money and want to continue making money. And, um, you know, that's why there's advertising. And so all I'm saying is something very obvious, which is that you can't just trust what you see around you and what you hear. It's your job as an individual to be critical. I mean, that's, I don't know what other duty we have as individuals besides, you know, caring for each other, is to be critical, to figure out what is it that you're told and to decide how it survives, you know, your own crap detector and what's left of it once you analyze it and look at it and decide whether you really want to believe in it. And most people, for different reasons, 
for that. It's too hard for them to do it, or it's too threatening. They believe it because because their group believes it, because their family believes it, because their religion believes it, because their society believes it, and that's why they believe it. And so I'm not necessarily criticizing anyone for that. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Our, our human and nature. But there's a, a human nature at work here. There's human nature and there's political, you know, establishments. There's human nature, and there's how we run society. And there are definitely um, trends that are supported by corporations, by governments, and that go along. And how do we know that? We just simply study history. We just simply look back the last decades, the last few decades, the last 100 years, 200 years, and we see how things change and what people believed and held on to, and then we discovered who was pushing what. We know how Coca-Cola has been pushing and funding an enormous amount of research on, on what makes people healthy, and, and we know that the tobacco industry, for example, was pushing an enormous amount of research with tens and tens of billions of dollars on what it is that you know causes cancer and directing and distracting scientists for for decades we know that the pharmaceutical industry has been promoting at the expense of you know probably 35 billion dollars per year pushing the the psychiatric drugs on people it it penetrates every nook and cranny of society every player professional associations ads on tv detail people for physicians all of that sustains a kind of a belief including our universities correct i mean including I, the universities yes i, I think yeah i yes, think that, yes. that that seems so critical Thank you for to bringing me. that up well simply because when people get educated they say oh i therefore now i know better because i'm educated and I know more than you. Well, you know, I, there's, you know, there's, of course, there are these, there's a little proverb, which is that when you're really, really educated is when you realize how much you don't know. Right. And, and every, every time, you know, I do something and, and somebody might say, wow, that sounds like it's really on the cutting edge. Or, and then I realize that that metaphor being on the cutting edge of, of knowledge or something just means that you are, in fact, literally on the edge of what is unknown, and the more that I feel I advance in what I, I think I understand, the more I realize how little I know, and that everything I think of is extremely provisional, and that people should take it that, should take it that way, and they should sort of take what people say not because of, uh, you know, I'm a professor, or I'm from, from a, a well-known university, or I have studied this for a long time. Well, that's important, but really, People have to develop their own critical thinking, their own ability to perfect their thinking according to some fairly universal standards of what thinking is, and trying to apply those to their own thought, their own conclusions. And that's, you know, that's a very difficult task, and I think I'm just, you know, a beginner at it. And you've been at this for a long time. Probably <laughs> about 40 years of pretty systematic uh, looking at the fields that I'm interested in. Right. Now, um, you know, it's, I, I, won't, I don't think we have time, unfortunately, to c touch on all the depths of... I just had the pleasure of listening to you, one of your lectures about coercion. And, um, and you were just sort of talking about this timeless notion that we as humans um, coerce. And we've, yep. and we've always done it, and we probably always, always will on some level. Yep. And, and you talk about the need to exclude uh, things that are afraid, that we're afraid of, and to be away from them because it's, we just feel safer when, when, you know, and to be, uh, to put them away from us if we feel endangered by them or endangered by a strange or different behavior or even a different value system that threatens our own value system. And then you talk about, and I'm touching on this because I, I think it's important um, but I want, and then I want to get to really the role of coercion in our second okay. half. But I also want to say also that it is a form of, of inclusion as well, that th this notion of, of people being, uh, being mentally ill, being sick, being a disease they can't help. 
Yes. And, and everybody says, oh, that helps, you know, contribute to ridding us of the stigma. But in many ways, it does the opposite because it solidifies this so-called diagnosis for life. Uh, as Robert Whitaker talks about in his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, he says, yeah. you know, there was a day where the shy girl in, in, in junior high could grow up and become an actress or the goofball uh, could become a, a, a winning entrepreneur. So we had the chance to be go through stages. Now your diagnosis for life, pills for life, and then all the adverse effects of, of potentially those in the long run. But, um, but, but that there is a part of us that wants to excuse away this uncomfortable behavior. Uh, can you talk just a little touch a bit on that, uh, the, the, how it helps us? It's done also to include people more, not just well, to exclude? Yeah, so, so first of all, I want to say that uh, you must have taken amazing notes uh, at this uh, lecture because you've summarized uh, uh, quite a whole bunch of points that I had made. Um, I think that the, 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 the thing to understand is that it, it's too simplistic to say that we, we create or we use this notion of mental illness just to exclude people. That's important, and I'll say a few words about that. Yeah. But, uh, and and the, the few words are simply that that's what we have done and we continue to do as long as we have the concept not only of mental illness, but even, you know, the ancient concept of just madness. And that the, the, the constant in the entire history of psychiatry has been coercion, but the, mostly coercion in order to exclude people. That is just push them away. Mm -hmm. Push them away from, from where? From us. From us. So we put them away somewhere, whether it was like the, the mythical sort of the ship of fools where you would just put them on a ship and then just push them down the river and forget about them. Or we put them in institutions that were, of course, always away from, you know, wherever people were in the cities. Or we killed them. We just killed people. Or we put them later on in the, in the, the modern insane asylums and everything. And today we put them in. But then, then, so there's that. And that's related, again, that's something very human, probably, unfortunately, part, possibly part of our nature to scapegoat. That is to put on some other person, because they are other the, the whole weight of the problems that we face and to say they're responsible somehow. And that's what scapegoating is. And so we have done that for thousands of years with the people we call mad and today mentally ill. That there's no question about it. But also at the same time, and that's where the modern notion of mental illness comes in, why did we then turn to the illness definition? Is because we did feel sorry for people and we wanted to save them from some harm and their families too. And one of the turning points was the issue of suicide, because suicide was, was considered for a long time an affront against God, an affront against nature, against God's laws. And then, he, and then what happened was that the, the suicide person's family was punished. Their possessions were stolen. Their, their, their cadaver, their body was, was hung. And so in other words, people began to feel sympathy for the survivors and wanted to avoid them. Uh, uh, um, from the, the, those harmful consequences. And that's when the notion comes in of the suicide person, not as a sinful person, but as someone who just didn't know, who didn't know better, who was not responsible for what they did. And that's, what, that's almost, almost the birth of that medical notion of mental illness. It comes with this notion to want to excuse some people and to prevent harm to, the, to, to their families. And then today we see it in after World War II when we began to sort of open the back wards of the mental institutions. And, and we wanted, there was a large push to include people in society, not to exclude them. There was a lot of faith and optimism that the American society and Western society could just solve any problem. It had, after all, defeated the Nazis. There was huge organization. People thought there's nothing we can't solve if we put our minds to it. And so that's what they did. They looked around and they saw that there were these hundreds of thousands of people, about 600, maybe 550,000 people were incarcerated in these institutions, sometimes for life, often for several years. No one could go in except involuntarily. You certainly couldn't come out easily. And so that's half a million people. 
incarcerated, excluded in the worst conditions. And society turned to that and said, let's include them. There was a lot of that in there, too. So this inclusion, too, this desire is important in the medical model. The question is, is that all it does? Do we really include them? And are, there, are there some darker, more hurtful uh, tendencies that we still have despite also wanting to include people. And, and, and on that note, that is the perfect note to take a short break on because I want to come back and follow up on that exact point and whether or not coercion actually does work. Is it effective or is it potentially more traumatizing uh, than it is helpful? Uh, we will be right back after these short messages. And we are back. You're listening to Dialogue on KSFR 101.1 FM. And we are speaking to David Cohen, a co-author of the book Mad Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs. And we're specifically focusing on the notion of coercion. Uh, is it helpful or is it harmful? What's your answer to that, David? Well, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you ask it that way, um, just think of wanting to get your child to do something or prevent your child from... You know, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just had this thought, though. I, I need to share this. Please. You know, I think as a society, our worst fear, you think of the Hollywood nightmare, you know, horror movies, and one of the worst possible fears people can imagine is being put away against your will, being told you're crazy, yes. right? I mean, that is is such a horrific fear for people, and yet... We consider it treatment, and it's good for them. And so how do we rectify that enormous fear with this notion that we're doing something to help people? Because life is filled with these contradictions. We're, we're, we, our behavior generally, both as individuals and as groups, is just chock full of contradictions, hypocrisies, paradoxes. So... There's nothing unusual about us saying one thing or being afraid of something or avoiding something and then actually, you know, inflicting it on other people. Yeah. That's a common theme throughout every society, every group. We do that, and, and every person almost. So, and that maybe was the genius of, uh, of Freud, to show that we are conflicted we're not necessarily very coherent, consistent, rational people. So number one is this kind of a, of a near rationality. Uh, but we also need coercion because we need to survive as groups. And as soon as you form yourself into a group and you adopt some, some common values, you, need, you, you want to maintain that. And coercion is sort of the last step in a little chain that starts with, when someone threatens your values or threatens the cohesiveness of your group, the first thing you try to do is you sort of try to persuade them. You, you, you discuss with them. You, you want to maybe seduce them in the sense of make your values seem attractive. You want to pull them in. But at some point, that breaks down. And then, you know, often you may try bribery or something else, but that may also break down then you have no choice but to coerce. And so that's, uh, you know, that to me is almost a universal pattern. So the question is, on what basis are we coercing people we call mentally ill? Well, in the old days, we just didn't have to have a reason. We just said they're threatening or they're beasts and we just need to chain them or they have no souls, or they're just like animals, or whatever we said. Today we say, well, because they're malfunctioning as bodies, their brain is not working. And so that makes them like marionettes or robots. They're irresponsible. We need to take them over. That's our rationale today. But the bottom line is, it's because they're threatening our values and threatening our cohesion as a group. And that's sort of, that's, that's, that's a simple answer why we do it. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's so it's, now, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, it seems a, a, a pretty clear-cut case of scapegoating, right? Yes, but, but if you 
it's justified in so many different ways. But the real, the real thing is your show, today's show I find is unusual in the sense that I have never in 40 years been asked ever to discuss that issue. Let's just look at coercion and let's just discuss it. And, and there's one thing you haven't asked me also, is how many people does this affect, say, every year in the United States? And I can have a simple answer. Nobody knows. There are no statistics that are kept at a national level as to how many people are coerced under mental health pretenses. We have lots of statistics on how many people are arrested and sent to jail in counties and states at the federal level. We have very little, if anything, on people sent to institutions using police, using judges, using professionals, using hospitals, lots of money, lots of manpower, lots of resources, there's not a single estimate. And that tells you how, I hate to use the word, but that's what it is, taboo the topic is. Yeah. And, and we do not have the tools to discuss it. We don't even know how many people are affected. Yeah, and do we have an involuntarily drugged estimate? How many people are, I mean, I've no, heard that, 80 that billion. that would be even harder. Uh -huh, no, okay. in terms of drugging would be even harder to, to estimate. We do know how many, we have a good estimate of how many people are taking psychiatric drugs. Mm -hmm. We know that it's about one in five or one in six adults mm -hmm. and about one in nine children. We know that now, uh, but we don't know what, you know, involuntary would mean. That would be a big question in terms of if they're not well informed as to what they're taking, if they've not been well informed, if they're kept in the dark about what we know and what we don't know about the drugs, are they taking them voluntarily? So that's a big question too. Uh, so, but in terms of involuntary commitment, what, what is called civil commitment, which involves at the first level, someone being taken by police or others or, or, or mandated state authorities into detention for an examination, for diagnosis, just to hold them, often called emergency hold, for about 72 hours. At which time, if the, in the opinion of the professionals, they're okay, they're just released. If not, the professionals are supposed to then get a hearing at which a judge will confirm they're being held for usually an extra two weeks and at which time, during which time they can be again let loose in the opinion of the psychiatrist. But again, if not, then a judge confirms again a, a, a detention for longer, usually three months and then up to six months, and in some cases up to a year. And so this is called civil commitment. There's also criminal commitment, which is a different story because people in that case usually are accused of a crime and are going through the criminal justice system. But that also takes a, a whole bunch of other people. Overall, it's probably about 2 million people every year in the U.S. from the rough estimates that I've been working on and uh, that, that I'm able to, to fathom. Probably about a million are civilly committed and probably about another three-quarters of a million are criminally committed. So that's a lot of people. But those are just rough estimates, and, and we don't have serious data on that. So do you, and so it's hard to know the effects of coercion, but from the data that you do have, what do you know about its impact? The, like you said, it's hard to know because it's not discussed, mm -hmm. because it's not investigated by, because you need money to, to fund research. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's not just sufficient for someone to be just motivated and to look into things. It takes resources, it takes assistance, it takes access to data. And so without the data, without the uh, major health funders looking into that issue, without foundations deciding that this is something that looks, needs looking into, let's at least document this, let's see the effects. You need to be able to follow people, to have control groups of people in similar situations, not committed. And so it's very difficult to organize. But when there's a will, there's a way. There's not much will to do that. So we don't know. All we have is accounts of people, individual accounts, subjective accounts, their personal accounts of what they went through when they were coerced. We have many of those. The Internet is full of them. There are books on that many accounts of ex-mental patients, current mental patients. Occasionally, some watchdog institution will publish a report. Uh, the report I saw recently was from British Columbia, 
a Canadian province north of us, and uh, it, um, it, it was a, 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 an incredible indictment, uh, but very well researched, of the system of civil commitment in the province of British Columbia. It's dated 2017. It has background research and interviews, and uh, right now I don't have the, the link to it, or, or even do I remember the title, but that was one of the best reports I saw, and one of the only reports on really the operation of civil commitment uh, from a real open-minded point of view. But the, but the notion is that it, it, some people are arguing now that it is potentially more traumatizing. Yes, yes. If, can you talk about that just uh, well, brief, briefly? Let me talk just to, to illustrate that very briefly. I'm going to talk about the issue of suicide. And what we do know is that immediately following a hospitalization, the rate of suicide of people who are immediately discharged within that month or two following a discharge from hospitalization, the suicide rate is astronomical. It's literally hundreds of times what it would be for a sort of community living suicidal person. So some people say, well, of course, it's, uh, they were very suicidal. They got hospitalized and then they got discharged. And uh, I guess they were still suicidal and they committed suicide. Other people say there's something about hospitalization that makes it even worse. So what is it about mental hospitalization or psychiatric hospitalization that would make your feeling that you want to end it all even worse? Well, it's being deprived of all power over what, who you are, what you wear, where you can go, being infantilized, being strip searched, being checked every 15 minutes. In other words, what we might think from the outside is, oh, I guess that's how we help people, may actually turn out to be worse than that. That's where maybe some harm is occurring. So that's one issue that is being debated, which is that is hospitalization for suicidal people, is that actually worse for them than uh, not hospitalizing them or finding ways to help them actively solve the problem? that may be leading to suicide. If we believe it's just mental illness, then we'll just hospitalize them for mental illness, we'll diagnose them with a mental or psychiatric diagnosis, and we'll treat them the way we treat all mental illness, and then we'll let them go. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very, a very much of a blame the patient mentality. Well, we, we're not, it may be maybe looking at it from a distance, but when you look at it close in a way, it's not. It's just saying that's what we do to help them. That's the only way we know to help them. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem, which is that we've learned that that's the way to do it, that these authorities really know what it's about, that the construct of mental illness really explains why some people might want to commit suicide. And so we've just bought that line and so we don't feel like, well, what else are we supposed to do? And that's a tough question, too. It's a really tough question. We're not necessarily equipped. We feel that somehow we must first diagnose, and then we'll have some better sense of what to do. But I think the problem of suicide, for example, has to be dealt with you know, in a, in a much more direct, open-minded way, on its own terms, first recognizing that we cannot predict who uh, might commit suicide, and we're pr we probably cannot save, even with our best intentions, most people who might really want to do that. Once we uh, accept that, we might see a lot more opportunities with less um, threats, with fewer uh, deprivation of liberty. We might see more opportunities to actually help people who have serious problems for which they think there are no solutions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so let me, let me, another thing I want to ask, it was something that you mentioned, I think, in, in the lecture, or I, at least I had in my notes, was this notion of that we talk about taking the stigma, stigma out of mental illness, and yet some of the people most guilty of stigmatizing people with, quote-unquote, mental illness is, are the people, the working professionals in that field? Yeah. It's well, the fir the fir yes, that's, that's maybe hard for many people to get. I mean, everywhere I go, the students I meet, everybody, down with the stigma of mental illness. No more stigma of mental illness. Well, 
Yeah, sure. Uh, why not? That's great. What do you mean exactly by that? Who's stigmatizing? So the issue is there is, number one, a stigma in society about people we call mentally ill. And, but that question is rarely looked at really fundamentally. Why is it that we are, quote, a stigma is literally putting a mark on someone? Why do we mark them in this way? The moment they say, uh, gee, I, uh, I've been depressed or I just couldn't function very well. So there is something there at work that needs just much more discussion and analysis. It's too glib to say stigma of mental illness. Why exactly are we stigmatizing? What is threatening to that? Let's examine that. Let's look at ourselves and see that. What's going on here? So I don't want to say there's no stigma out there. There definitely is a lot of stigma. But it's, it's kind of, but it, it needs much more discussion. What are we afraid of? What are we protecting ourselves from when we stigmatize? But then by the same token, while we say let's increase access to treatment and everything, the moment somebody fires a gun and kills people in some sensational way, we're right away, but the mentally ill and they need treatment and they need forced treatment and let's keep the guns out of the, the hands of the mentally ill. You know, right away. We are immediately going at that. That's major stigma from the authorities. And that includes presidents and politicians and professionals and law enforcement across the board. They're the first to say the mentally ill are responsible and let's control the mentally ill. So how do you expect people to actually feel like, yeah, I guess I want to go for treatment when they know that when anything goes wrong, they're going to be blamed? Yeah, and, the, and this notion that the psychiatric uh, realm has kind of full, full authority to do what they will, at will. Uh, I, I've even recently heard of a, a woman whose son was put through electroshock treatment, uh, even despite the fact that his, um, his psychiatric advance directive called for no electroshock treatment. But under the clause of reasonable treatment, if authorities, psychiatric yeah. authorities, deem it, quote-unquote, reasonable to give him electroshock, they can give him electroshock against his will. To me, there's something about that that's even more scary than being put in jail. Because in jail, at least I know I'm paying the consequence of my crime. Whereas if I go into a hospital, I think I'm going to be helped. And then I walk out, and they've, they've electroshocked my brain, and they can make it look as humane as possible. But the bottom line is that I don't want you touching my brain. But they Not have the right to do that. Yes, yes, they have the right to do that. That, that is done almost on a daily basis. Uh, relatively involuntary electroshock and not being informed of what exactly it could be and also just outright electroshock against your will yeah. with going to court and trying to get judges to actually continue the treatment on the stated objections of the person and sometimes their family. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's so almost it, like getting it, ambushed. I it think. is getting ambushed and you, you touched at a point of the kind of, you know, uh, what's the word, the, the sort of twisted helplessness, the sort of helplessness squared that can occur or happen as you're involuntarily hospitalized. And then you can get a sense of how powerless and betrayed and tortured a person could feel in, the, in that circumstance, that they wouldn't even have the words sometimes even to articulate the predicament they're in, because everyone is saying you're there to be helped. Yeah. And they feel exactly the opposite and that they have been betrayed. And the more they begin to express that, the more it's seen as evidence that they need more of that treatment. Right. So it is a kind of a it's – a, it's worse than a catch-22. It's a kind of a Kafkaesque situation to be in. Sometimes it's undescribable. And that's why you don't often hear about it. Yeah. But that is something that I'm, again, grateful that your show, that you have sort of brought this, you know, want to discuss this idea. I wish it were discussed more open. Well, we and will. I, yeah, and I just wish we could see in, in, in a minute or so that, that all of us sort of participate into upholding this practice by not talking about it well, and by I, not looking behind the door to see what exactly goes on. Right, and a lot of abuses can go on with unfettered power. And, and you hear that happening, too, people, yeah. as you said, being strip searched, violated, etc. So when we have no watchdog over this, this realm of psychiatry or mental health profession at large, as you said, it's, it's a larger construct, 
uh, it's you know it, it, there's no nobody watching watching over what they're doing, and that that leads to the possibility of more uh, of more abuse taking place. It, in some ways, it strikes me as being kind of the our dirty little secret that you know that's part yeah. of why we don't want to talk about it because it's so scary. I don't want to be there. I don't want to know anyone. I don't want to know that, know that this is happening in my society in today's day and age. Absolutely. I yeah. just do want to mention that there is an, a, a part of, of mental health intervention, if you will, which is, though dwindling, it's still there and it's still useful, and that's voluntary conversation, sort of face-to-face -face conversation with someone who really has your interests in mind and tells you up front that they're not going to coerce you to the extent possible. They're, they make it very explicit, and they tell you that they're there just, you know, bounce ideas off you and listen to you and try to understand you from as close as possible and then relay back to you what they see. And that's a lot of work that a lot of therapists do. And I don't want to throw them in that the whole bag that I've described and that I've criticized. Yeah. But there is that piece, too, though it's getting smaller and smaller because, again, we speak the same language, we follow the same diagnoses, and we are all sort of mandated to report and to, you know, uh, have uh, no discretion about what must be reported, the abuse and everything. So we're the balance in terms of individual liberty and and the, the, the state's uh, right to sort of protect the public health is, is shifting a lot in favor of the state lately. And, and so we, we, we might need some, some redressing of that balance. Let's, let's shift gears for a second and talk about solutions. There's two solutions that you proposed, and I liked one of them was change our language, but the other that you talked about was also um, taking the secrecy and de deception away from coercing people and just being out front about it and saying, you know what, yeah, you said some scary things. I'm afraid I am attempting to coerce you. I'm going to admit that I am coercing you, and here's why, and at least that gives that person a chance to respond uh, so I like that. But can you also talk about the importance of changing our language and, and using the term mental illness carefully, or maybe not at all? Um, I, I myself do not use the term mental illness, except if it's sort of in a class to discuss that it is a term that exists and used. And you may think that's very unusual, but I try to use other words that, that are a bit more uh, longer and cumbersome, but more descriptive to me, like uh, being troubled, uh, being upset, being sad, being deprived, being displaced, uh, being uh, uh, disturbed, whatever it is. But I don't necessarily tie it to any kind of illness. So number one, and when we talk about involuntary interventions, let's call them for what they are. They're involuntary. They're not assisted treatments. They're not outpatient commitment. They're legal interventions that use the power of the state to detain people without any real due process, without them having the chance to argue immediately, without them being appointed a lawyer, either like we do for criminal accusations, uh, to defend themselves against that accusation. So, of course, now we've mixed in so much into that category of people, the homeless, the people who are even failures of their own criminal uh, uh, activity. They're all in the me mental illness category. Plus, our jails are overflowed with people that we call mentally ill also, and that we c confine uh, uh, in solitary confinement. So the whole thing is messed up and mixed up. We don't know what's what. The jails are hospitals. The hospitals are jails. We can't figure it out anymore. So all of that requires some sort of back to basics this is a legal intervention when we put someone away. It's not a hospitalization. It's a detention. That's all it is. So we need to call it by what it is, number one, which to throw more light on it. Yeah, so, so the idea of being more accurate in our language and descriptive as opposed to diagnostic. Like yeah. I, I love the, and back to, again, that Robert Whitaker quote, go, go, going back to descriptive words rather than diagnostic ones. You're shy yeah. as opposed to... Uh, you As have opposed so to you have social phobia. Exactly. Social you know, anxiety which, disorder. Right. Right. But, but by, by saying you've got this, it kind of, literally, uh, the image is there is something inside you somewhere that we uh, hope to locate or we, we think we know where it is, but no one knows, but it's there. And so, and, and you have no control over it. That's mm -hmm. the thing, too. It's inside you, but you can't control it. Who can? Well, I guess the drugs we're giving you, and uh, but what about, but they thought it was that drug, and now they say it's this drug or these three drugs, or, but it doesn't get better. They say, well, you know, that's the way it is, but, you know, we know, and that's what we know. And so, you know, a lot of helplessness is created that way. And I believe a lot 
of harm that's not quite recognized or studied is also created by these beliefs that somehow trap people a little bit into cycles of helplessness. Right. It kind of it removes a person's agency by saying, you've got this diagnosis, you can't help it. Right. So it, it seems that it, it removes their own agency over self on the one hand. At the same time, it can give them excuses to behave in all sorts of ways and say, well, yes. I'm just crazy. Right. Yes. And, and that's another function of, of the mental health professions is to excuse, is to excuse behavior. That's obvious. So one is to, in a way, hold up uh, people who are innocent but who disturb us in ways that are fundamental, but, but they're innocent of crimes. And another one is to excuse people who actually are guilty of something, who actually have done something, but we don't want to punish them. So then we say they're mentally ill. So you've got these two sort of pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, we, I, I wonder, why don't we want to punish people for doing because, because irresponsible Because we want to be things. nice. Because uh -huh. we want to be nice. That's back to us as human beings. We want to be nice. We want to take care of people. We want to hug them and say, hey, you're part of us. Let's, right. let's, let's grow together. Even though, that, the, even though the, the system is inherently, uh, inherently uh, hip, uh, hypocritical. Well, it, it's, it's a bit like a family, you know. There's right. a lot of love, but there's a lot of hypocrisy in a family. Yeah. And a family is a basic institution. And, and, you know, parents use all kinds of tactics, including frank coercion, often unfortunately beating and beating very hard and sometimes killing their children. And so we have the whole gamut. But there's a lot of love, too, and there's a lot of forgiveness, and there's a lot of inclusion. Yeah. And so that is reflected in society, too. I really... We're not consistent. We just are human beings. There you go. We're Di not perfect. Diagnosis, human. <laughs> I like to say that. And, and I like the idea of changing how we dialogue. So the critical piece is openness. It's the opposite of coercion. It's the openness and the lack of deception, honesty, straightforwardness. And that in itself can perhaps begin a new yeah. dialogue. We'll see where that takes us, right? Who knows? I hope so. That's really well uh, diagnosed, MK. I want to thank you so much, David Cohen, uh, for joining us today. The book is Mad Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs. Thank you all so much for listening, and thank you again, David, for being with us. Thank you very much, MK.